Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SURF webinar series. We've got people popping on. We're going to give it one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our SURF webinar series. I'm Gerlindy Wolf, an environmental engineer with Ramble and a longtime SURF member. I'm the current SURF president on the board of trustees. Um, I wanted to welcome you all today and let you know a little bit about the Sustainable Remediation Forum or SURF. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, SURF is a nonprofit organization made up of volunteers from disciplines all across the remediation industry. Our mission is to advance sustainable remedies and practices on a local and global scale through collaboration, education, and innovation. Um, you can get more information and check us out on our website. We have a lot of resources and um, guidance documents available. You can follow us on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter tags are listed here, or um, sign up for our newsletter and you can stay um, up to date with our current events and initiatives. Um, this webinar series is open to SURF members and non-members alike. If you're not yet a SURF member, we invite you to support us and um, join us as a member. I'll post a link to our membership information page um, in the webinar chat and you can grab it from there. Um, our presenter today would like to introduce Rick Weiss. He is a senior geologist at Battelle with over 35 years of experience in um, development, implementation, and management of site remedial investigations, compliance, and remediation projects. His current technical work involves PFAS site investigations and remediation and the impact of climate change on waste site restoration and management. Um, we can go to the next slide, please, as well. Um, Rick is a longtime SURF member, one of our founding members. So he's been with uh, the organization for quite a long time. Um, he's served several terms on the board of trustees and in, been spearheading several SURF initiatives and committees in the past. He's currently serving as an instructor for the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department for graduate level remediation engineering classes at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, he received a Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Oregon and a Master of Science in Geology from Western Washington University. Recently, Rick has helped work with SURF and the Society of American Military Engineers to establish a strategic partnership between the two organizations. So welcome to Rick. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to your presentation today on climate resilient remediation. Well, thank you, Rolindy. I hope my sound's coming through clear. Um, see, I'm going to discuss today climate resilient remediation, and it really feels great to be able to be talking on the SURF webinar. Uh, so it's like, I feel like old home week. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, Rolindy mentioned this uh, SAME and SURF strategic partnership. Uh, SAME has 28,000 members, and a lot of them are looking at resiliency and remediation. Um, and our, our mission, I'm the chair of the, community, the Environmental Community of Interest. And I just thought it'd be really great to have some kind of bridge between SURF and the uh, SAME folks in the environment and resiliency uh, as a way to promote each other's programs and, and maybe get more folks aware of what the good work SURF is doing and maybe help build up SURF's membership and involvement. But SAME is a pretty large organization. Um, it's civilian. Uh, it's made up of uh, civilian and, and uniform services, many federal agencies. Uh, this slide here has some basic information. We can have webinars. I'm hoping today to get some of the SURF developed webinars out there onto the SAME platform. Uh, networking, networking is important. We put the presentations and panels together for our joint engineering training conference. And right now, PFAS being the big elephant in the room for the DOD, we have a lot of uh, industry and government engagement projects going 
on helping understand it. Uh, we have a monthly phone call also. Uh, my email is below if you're interested um, in SAME or even more information about SERP, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. Next slide, please. Now down to the, the topic of the day. So, and, and this is where SERP is one of the pioneering groups in this area, basically taking the green sustainable remediation concepts and realizing a new dimension to it, climate change. I remember years ago, Barbara Mako, a former board member and uh, officer, uh, really started getting us together to put together a white paper, and, and that was the catalyst for IPRC doing some work in this area, too. So uh, SERP has always been a groundbreaker, but we also know that contaminated site remedies we need to start designing them, implementing them, and monitoring them to withstand climate change impacts. It's like a whole new dimension. Um, and we're already seeing the impact of climate change on waste sites. I'll show some examples. Uh, and, and it needs to be in the complete life cycle of a project. One of the great lessons I learned working with SERP was you don't start thinking about sustainability at the remediation, it, but that's a good name. You start thinking about the sustainability and now even the climate change impacts when you're scoping the project from day one, the project lands on your plate, a problem arises, you're going to investigate, try to find a way to do the remediation, be careful of your environmental footprint, and now factor in, where's my site, what climate change factors do I need to have? And that should start in the work plan stage to set the goals and agenda for that. Uh, next slide, please. So, the Fourth National Climate Assessment kind of summarized what a lot of us kind of know from reading the media and, and, and literature. You know, uh, temperatures are rising, sea levels rising, the rates of rise are getting faster. We're seeing heavy rainfall events that are unprecedented. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast, you now know what the West Coast feels like when half the state of California is burning, a massive fire and smoke. That's not, that was not normal. I mean, I lived in both areas of the country and never remember smoke like that. Uh, we're also seeing I just look out my window in April and things that should be blooming in May are blooming and things that should be leaves falling up trees. I mean, climate change is real, okay? I don't think anyone on this call is gonna get into an argument about that. Uh, and forest fires we're seeing are pretty, pretty phenomenal. Uh, right now, the fourth national climate assessment is an internal review and it should be out soon. And it'll probably be confirming and substantiating a lot of the issues and concerns that we are dealing with today. Next slide, please. Okay, a little sidebar story. Many, many years ago, I was at a Department of Defense uh, headquarters, I will not name the department, discussing a site located in the lowland areas of the East Coast. Uh, we're doing an optimization review with some folks about the remediation. And I took a sidebar and said, hey, you know, this particular Department of Defense agency has lots of sites located in areas where you might want to consider sea level rise. Have you ever thought what's going to happen in 20, 30 years to your sites um, when storm surge and sea level rise may impact them or river flooding or severe weather? And the answer I got, and this is probably about seven or eight years ago, was no, we're really concerned with the cost to complete and the number of sites we can close and get off the books. And then the next, someone in the room, I never quite said, oh, Rick is one of those surf guys. He's in sustainability. And it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty upsetting. That's like, that's not what you want to hear. But now I can show you the slide, Department of Defense Climate Adaptation Plan. Now they have to consider climate change impacts and everything. And most of the climate change impacts we're looking at and, and adaption plans, they're looking more, at least in the Department of Defense, more of this facilities training and resilient area. Uh, there's not a lot in these documents on impacts to solid waste landfills, schmoos, erector facilities, or waste sites at DOD facilities. But the concepts really apply the same. If your runway is going to go underwater and you lose its use, uh, well, that's going to happen to your treatment system or your treatment unit. And it's not just the remediation aspect. It's really uh, every place we have, industry, uh, hazardous waste, manufacturing, the concepts are really the same. And the EPA also came out in 2021 with the Climate Adaptation Action Plan. So no one's gonna joke with me anymore about, no, we don't care about that. Now it's, it's required, there's the numerous executive orders and directives, and I'm 
each of the services, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, all have your own, by requirement, bombing adaptation plans. Next slide, please. So, don't have to spend a lot of time on this one, but we all kind of know the, the basic, I hope everyone knows the ins and outs of the climate change impacts, the weather, fires, drought, um, you know, decreasing snowpack, water supply, melting permafrost. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because this is kind of basic one-on-one -on -one stuff and I think everyone here is kind of aware of it. So next slide, please. I saw this article when it came out getting six years ago. It's a little dated, but it really struck me as, as an eye-opener that the Associated Press did a study in 2017 and they showed 327 Superfund sites in flood-prone areas. And this was sort of a start when I know EPA, one of our uh, uh, SERP allies, uh, Carlos Panchin at EPA, started putting together fact sheets and started to look at, you know, green, green sustainable remediation and climate change issues. But take a look at this, you know, it's basically California, New Jersey, Florida, places you expect low level, you know, sites, coastal areas, rivers. Another thing that I read back then was that in the state of New Jersey, um, if there was five, level, five feet of sea level rise, which is at the time was probably a high case, 2,000 waste sites would be inundated. Now, that's pretty scary because none of them are designed for inundation, maybe storm surge or some or heavy rainfall events, but not to be submarine sites with sea level rise. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so my own work, I started discovering climate change issues uh, many years ago. Uh, I was working on several projects for the Army Corps of Engineers in the Mississippi Valley. And um, we had uh, on the left there, it's kind of the guy standing there. If you look carefully, you can see sort of the bottom of the picture looks uh, black and white tone, brown you know, tone, and above it you see green for color. Uh, this was a site, the Savannah Army uh, Depot, where we were supposed to do capping, waste consolidation, producing new monitoring wells. And what we didn't figure into was major, major flooding continuously for a construction season. So you can see that operator of the chainsaw, uh, you know, that's the water level, and, and that was one of the higher areas on the site, and we just couldn't, couldn't work. I mean, major impact to site, site remediation and construction. Uh, we were fortunate to be working with the Corps of Engineers closely, and we came out pretty whole with all the delays. On the right is a bioremediation recirculation project at another site uh, along the Mississippi River, where the city, and it's, it's, it's in the Davenport, Iowa area, and if you follow the news, Davenport has had some horrific floods in the Mississippi, like the 100-year flood happens three times in one year. And we were set up to do a bioremediation pilot study. I got to the site and said to my crew, wait a minute, don't you guys realize the river is closer to the, to the work site? It was like with that orange well in the background sticking up, we had a, a control trailer with all of our equipment. And I had to get a tow truck company, a flatbed company, had to cut all the lines, till all the wells and pull our equipment out of there. Uh, the funny thing is a boat was going by and I started yelling at it, don't make a wave, don't make a wave. And he guess he says to me, the guy yells at me like, who's dumb enough to put a building next to the river? And I said, well, the river doesn't belong here. It's supposed to be 10 feet deeper and 50 yards that away. But that's the, the headache of flooding. So early on, my actual remediation implementation projects got hammered by, um, you know, severe weather, uh, not normal weather patterns. Whether it was climate change or not, I don't know. But it's a good example of the reality we really are facing. Next slide, please. And just once again, this is not, not rocket science news, but this is a map of the East Coast, a uh, U.S. Coast Guard hazard uh, change map. Uh, the, red, the red is showing you where there's going to be significant sea level rise impacts. Um, if you look at the Chesapeake Bay Area, um, quite a few military, besides the civilian infrastructure, a uh, major concern for the Department of Defense is uh, a lot of bases there in Norfolk. And, uh, and if you go up to Maryland, uh, the Naval Academy. Some of you know me know I have a daughter who is graduating from the Naval Academy. And when I went to her car as a junior and senior, I would tell her whenever there's a storm, park it 
on high ground. Do not park it near the water. Uh, and I'd always text her and she'd say, yes, I did. But then she'd tell me afterwards, well, I moved it after you texted me that. So, but didn't want that car getting rusty or in the way with seawater, salt water. Because Annapolis downtown, if you ever had the pleasure of visiting this great little town, uh, the downtown is, is flooded quite often, right? By the harbor with the sea level rise. Next slide, please. And back in 2017, uh, they had uh, Hurricane Harvey. Uh, this was one of the very widely reported in the media, storm surge and the hurricane passing over the San Jacinto River waste pits. Made a lot of news when EPA was afraid that this was a capped in place PCB and other waste site that the cap may have been damaged and it was slightly damaged, but I don't believe any waste was released. But once again, uh, you know, we're seeing this now in the news, a major concern. And really now when we see flooding in all the rivers, we see oil terminals, industrial facilities, uh, major environmental, major environmental problem, uh, releasing all that contamination, and even basically irregular POTWs, uh, not, not great for the environment. Next slide, please. So this is a quick case study here. This is EPA Region 2 American Sandman Superfund site. Uh, basically, Hurricane Floyd in 1999 and Irene in 2011. Uh, these impoundments released contamination. Uh, the remedy was excavate waste, solidify, stabilize, and put a protective cover on. The original design really didn't include, you know, climate resilient measures. But by 2012, they started realizing that this is near the Raritan River. Uh, it better start thinking about this stuff. So when Hurricane Ida caused a 500-year uh, flood uh, in 2021, by stepping ahead of the curve and doing some resiliency measures, the impoundments were overtopped, but it really, some of it worked. It kept uh, minimum burn damage and, uh, you know, and they were able to release 200 million gallons in the controlled release on the catastrophic release. And now they're moving forward with the site with 500-year uh, events being the norm, which is a pretty good insurance policy. Uh, to your right, there's a picture of the impoundments and the flooding. Um, you know, if, for those of you on the East Coast, you know that the Raritan River and the Passaic River quite often have significant flood issues uh, in the river plains. Next slide. And this is just showing you a picture of the flooding that happened uh, during uh, Ida. Uh, you can see the, the uh, site. Uh, well, the reason my point wouldn't matter. But basically, you can see a wide area of the uh, of the area, wide area of flooding. And the picture on the left just kind of shows you uh, the groundwater treatment plant, which was raised up a bit there, is surrounded by flood water. And we need to raise our structures. Uh, next slide. Just another couple pictures from American Sandman Superfund site. Uh, you can see electric controls for full scale groundwater are, are sitting high up above uh, flooding. And you can see that there's also uh, on-site flood resistant enclosures and bollards on concrete foundations. When I saw the picture on the left, it reminded me of the change stations and restrooms at uh, Coney Island in Brooklyn. I have some relatives there. And after Superstorm Sandy, the New York City Parks Department raised all that infrastructure up to where you have to climb steps to get up to it, which, which makes sense. Um, so this is basically going to be more of a common practice is to put your water water sensitive instrumentation and controls uh not on the first floor maybe on the third or fourth floor or raise them up on the platform like you see here and and these pictures and materials are from usap us epa factions uh which is a great source of information next slide so another site that actually Vitell worked on a little bit here is epa region 10 court hadlock uh, the North Landfill, it's in uh, Washington State, Puget Sound, across from Seattle. Uh, they did put some original shoreline protection systems in, and usually there it was like logs, you just build it together, log revetments and things like that. Uh, standard practice was semi-annual uh, uh, inspection or after storm events, uh, but they started seeing erosion. And what they tried to do is start doing some geogrid vegetation with wave and saltwater tolerant plants. A little shout out there for early on engineering with nature solutions, uh, using native plants and trying to get vegetation to act as a buffer and stabilization. Uh, and then they had the five year review um, and they saw additional erosion and well damage. So, you know, went through the five year review process, you assess the effectiveness of your remedy. 
and if it's not protective or it's threatened, you got to do something about it. So they moved up with similar rock, more heavy armoring. Uh, and as sea level rises, basically, the current remedy will remain protective. And you got to maintain your, uh, your monitoring and your inspections. Uh, they did consider a more aggressive approach was basically to uh, retreat, to basically, um, you know, remove some of the waste and relocate it, cost prohibitive. You know, everyone probably knows uh, moving a landfill is really quite expensive and really very practical, uh, you, you know, um, probably create more risk than it's worth. So they also looked at, you know, how, how much infrastructure, how much hardening can we do? And you get to the point where you might impact local shellfish harvest. Uh, and so they came up with just basically modifying some of the current situation. Next slide. And that just shows you basically uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the large rocks that were put in, uh, the vegetation on the, the landfill on the, on the uh, top slide and the right side side of the slide. And also one of the important factors that we all need to consider now as part of our engineering and the life cycle of a project is, and I'll get to it, I'm getting ahead a little bit, identify the climate, potential climate impacts and start looking at the data to see what they might be. And you can see on the left here, you know, a relative sea, lo sea level rise, uh, high scenario in 2050s, 1.44 feet, and extreme scenario. So 2100, you know, a five foot, Sea level rise is the high scenario, and with some of the um, melting scenarios, as much as nine feet, which would probably be very catastrophic. So, next slide. Uh, just another picture of the Fort Haddock site. You can see there's armoring there, and uh, you know, the revetment right there on the beach, and then there's uh, healthy vegetation on top of it to help reduce storm surge and hold things in place. And on the left, basically, those are the transects that are surveyed in and checked uh, annually or after major storm events to see how things are changing. So um, new monitoring required, um, not just, uh, you know, more scientific monitoring. I know a lot of times you look at a eyeball landfill erosion, but I think to have the data set you need to be sensitive, you've got to start doing a little bit more detailed surveying just to know how the changes are happening over time. Next slide, please. So, one of the major drivers in climate resilient remediation, one of the things that's a major trigger, which is why no one's going to laugh anymore about uh, climate change impacting the remediation, is the five year review. Basically, as most people, as you probably realize, uh, at surplus sites, as well as at DOD sites that are not unrestricted closure, they, they, they may not be surplus sites, but they may be following the circle of process. So, the DOD implements a five year review process. And in that process, following section 121 of the, of the uh, National Contingency Plan, uh, you have to ask yourself three questions about a site. One, is the remedy function as intended by the decision documents, whether it be a, a rod or a record closure document? You have to basically say, is it working? Number two, are the exposure assumptions, toxicity data, cleanup levels, and legal action objectives, RAOs, used at the time of the remedy still valid? Imagine what happens when you're changing MCL. That's where that would fall in, or new toxicity data. But the one that's really open, what I like to say, Pandora's box for the uh, climate change impact, has any other information come to light that could call into question the protectiveness of the remedy? And one of the major buckets of concern in that area is climate change impacts and severe weather. Um, if you, you know, and that's that's. There's a couple of examples that I just showed you that would basically question the remedy protectiveness. And that's what's happened at uh, quite a few sites. Next slide, please. So, EPA, uh, I, think, I think Carlos may have been involved in some of this early on, but basically, you know, you have the five year review, you've got to basically, that's too late in my opinion. It starts, like I said earlier, at the, at the scoping part of the project. But basically, there's some really simple things to start thinking about. Vulnerability assessment. You evaluate the remedy's exposure to climate or weather hazards, uh, you know, flooding, sea level rise. Uh, you evaluate the sensitivity of the has of those hazards. You know, it's a risk assessment. It's a risk analysis. What's the hazard? What's the chance of the hazard happening? What's the low, medium, and high level cases of the hazard impacting your site? 
And what measures can you do to correct it? Resiliency measures. Um, what do you do to secure the remediation systems? What do you do to secure the landfill cover? What other barriers or physical structures do you have to put in? What extra monitoring and oversight measures do you have to have to understand what the changes can be and will be? And, and also, basically, how do you train personnel and maybe even change your response times? I mean, if you have a site that's going underwater, uh, you may have, like, hurricane preparation. You may have hazardous waste site preparation. Good, sound, common sense uh, safeguards uh, for systems and, and people. Next slide, please. So also adaptive capacity, you know, you've got to implement, you can have all the resiliency measures and training you want, but you have to implement those measures, which has in terms of time and money. Um, and you may have to have plans, just like, you know, updating uh, your remedy uh, selection or your O&M manuals and your procedures. So um, that's the adaptive capacity there. Um, and it's not a straight line function. You know, as you do things and adapt to things, you monitor and adjust as necessary. Um, but unfortunately, climate change isn't static, and the changes seem to sometimes be uh, geometric uh, or severely incremental. When you get 300 year storms in two months, like I had, whether it's climate change or not, it's a great lesson learned on adapt adaptability. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of summarizing uh, the EPA climate change resiliency evaluation for 2019. You look at the system vulnerability, it's a great little flow chart. What's the exposure? What's the sensitivity? Uh, what are the measures to increase the resilience? Identify those measures and prioritize their implementation. And then basically implement the measures and you, and you periodically reassess them. Uh, this is basically the same cookbook for adaptive site manager adaptive site management, uh, always a loop. Uh, I, I try to emphasize to my students at Carnegie Mellon that remediation and really most engineering is no longer A, B, and C straight line thinking. It's A to B, go back to A, maybe move to C, and a lot of, a lot of, re, a lot of redo loops there, which is, is not making mistakes, it's just avoiding them in the future. Next slide. And to help with this effort, there's quite a bit of information that EPA has on the clue in CLU, uh, dot CLU IN dot org site, clue in org site. I got lists of uh, links here that I've checked and most of them still work. So you actually really have a lot of tools and this is one of the early ways we used to look at resiliency and remediation and, and green remediation, like let me say green and sustainable remediation, was to just look at these basic simple uh, lookup tables and lists to identify things, best management practices, pretty simple stuff. We have the groundwater extraction and containment system. Uh, you can look at your wells at the top of that, vertical barriers, pipe systems, and you can see on the right-hand side there, just a very simple identification of some of the potential vulnerabilities due to extreme weather. So I call this the checklist approach, and it's very effective, and it brings you awareness very quickly as to looking at a system and, and First, identify your climate change uh, impact. This is due to extreme weather. There's, there's other types of tables and uh, ways of looking at this for other climate impacts, and we don't have enough time in a, a short webinar to go all of them. This is a good example of those things, okay? So, next slide. Uh, just another example of groundwater extraction system. This is kind of showing what are some of the climate change effects that may hit the system. Temperature, precipitation, wind, sea level rise, uh, wildfires, um, and just sort of uh, giving, once again, another checklist. So you can really zero in very quickly on knowing where your site is and looking at some of these background information uh, to figure out what's going on. Next slide. And there's this really super resource that was developed by a team that SURF started uh, the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council. Uh, if you're not aware of the IPRC, you should be. Uh, it's a fantastic source for a lot of information about remediation and site cleanup. And, um, you know, you can't go wrong with these folks. A lot of members of the Sustainable Remediation Forum were involved in this team when it started off. And essentially, uh, their document lists the, uh, you know, sustainable resilient remediation, 
Uh, it gives you the uh, an overview of the importance and value of sustainable resilient radiation. Uh, then I think a cool tool which I'll explain a little further is the state resource map. Uh, it also has a section on integrating social and economic dimensions of sustainable uh, resilient remediation. Uh, remember that our concept is economy, uh, social, and environment, and we don't want to, want to drop that. And, and now we're seeing with the uh, significant number of sites that are located in areas that usually along rivers or areas that uh, have in communities of color or low income, uh, those emerging together. Uh, environmental justice is, is sort of tying in quite heavily with uh, sustainable uh, resilient remediation uh, based on climate change. Uh, best practices for project life cycle, a standard of uh, ITRC documents. Fantastic reference list. Um, you know, you, you, this is a web-based document there, and the references are, are just really, really heavy duty. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, case studies listed, as well as some really cool checklists. And the other thing ITRC does is they provide training. If you go to the website, you can find out that there may be a webinar, which will get more into the details of this document. I like the resource map. I clicked on the state resource map, and it sort of indicates to you, you know, um, you know, what's a state legislative or regulatory environment for uh, climate change issues. And here in Pennsylvania, my home state, I'm based in Pittsburgh. Uh, you can see essentially that there are resources, there's plans and strategies and reports and websites, and that's the green, that's the blue square, and the green triangle is an executive order, um, and also wildfire resilience. Uh, there's also resources for that. Uh, in my, we don't get fires like the West does, but we do have hardwood forests that our fire season in normal weather is the fall. Um, we just went through a stretch of 21 days without rain, so it could be spring too, and we didn't have any fires. So once again, this is a really valuable resource. This is a, I think, this plus the uh, surf paper is our starting points for understanding the issues. Next slide. And what, as I mentioned, it's a project life cycle. It starts at the remedy. All these things start. These assessments start at the beginning of the project. So when you do a conceptual site model, uh, maybe start thinking of adding that fourth, I think the fourth dimension is how we try to mention, deal with it. Climate change, what I'm thinking today, where is it gonna be in five, 10 years? And what's the climate change impacts going to be? Maybe start thinking of the vulnerability assessments right away. And as always, as we preach and surf, stakeholder engagement is critical. Don't work in a box. You've got multiple stakeholders, communities, NGOs, regulators, um, and other professionals. So it's, uh, you know, the more stakeholder engagement you have, usually the path to the, to completeness is, is, and uh, success is easier. And on some of the sites though, that's sometimes a, a hard challenge. So next slide. And once again, basically it's not a, it's not a straight line uh, equation uh, vulnerability, uh, extreme event occurs, uh, identify, prioritize best management practices, evaluate the effectiveness, and then go back. So I, I guess everything in my career has become a major feedback loop. But we do get to an endpoint sometimes. Uh, next slide. And states have their own programs. I know I've been working in California in the Bay Area, and there's numerous coastal commissions and studies and and it's almost like almost too many, but there's various agencies and commissions in California studying climate change impacts as related to just normal infrastructure and, and uh, development. But also, it can also rolls into the uh, remediation area too. New Jersey, you can see right there, site remediation and waste management program, uh, technical guidance for uh, catastrophic events and contaminated sites. On the right is adaptive strategies for resilient cleanup remedies. The Washington Department of Ecology was one of the first to do that. And if you actually have a site in the state of Washington, I think you have to in your annual performance report, not just your five year review, and this is becoming really standard for a lot of places, annually report what your climate sensitivity may be, if something's happening, or show an awareness of the climate sensitivity and, and show you're monitoring it. So in Washington, uh, the DOE there 
uh, with a lot of sites along the Puget Sound, a lot of naval facilities, we see this as an annual requirement. So no longer anybody saying to me, it doesn't matter. It's reality. And, and California also is starting to require it. California actually, I guess we'll go to the next slide and, um, and I'll explain a little further. Uh, another urge, this has become sort of a, a new issue that's come up with climate change and a significant one. Uh, and it's always been out there. You know, the interaction of sea level and groundwater at coastal areas. Um, you know, on the picture on the left, you see normal sea level. And if you have sea level rise, it, it could force the uh, freshwater wedge or freshwater uh, elevations higher. As salt water rises, the lighter freshwater rises up with it. And this could actually cause a lot of headaches for sites where now your depth of water is not five feet, it's three feet. And you left waste in place. You may have some a capped site with residual contamination and industrial waste standard that's sitting there and now it's, it's submerged. It could be exposed uh, atmospherically. It could also be migrating in the shallower groundwater. And this has really become quite a, quite a concern in California. Uh, a lot of work here by Dr. Christina Hill of the University of California, Berkeley, looking at this issue. And it's gotten to the point where the California Department of Toxic Substance Control um, is requiring an annual assessment. And I, I didn't update my slides for this yet. I probably should. It's pretty recent that they came out with a guidance document where you actually have to show uh, almost proof of, proof of no impact uh, based on projected sea level rise and, um, you know, in minimum, minimum scenarios, middle scenarios, and high scenarios over time. And you as the PRP or the site owner or manager are responsible to do that. So California has put sea level rise impacts uh, impacting sites and groundwater uh, on the radar as a requirement for evaluation and awareness. Okay, next slide, please. And just as an example here, um, this on the left there is the former Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in the surrounding area. Uh, this is an environmental justice area. It was a major shipyard uh, since World War II. Uh, it also included a lot of uh, low-level radio, radiological work, uh, chemical, uh, you know, solvents, petroleum, hydrocarbons, landfills, uh, numerous parcels. It is prime real estate for redevelopment in the city of San Francisco. Uh, it is a Superfund site under the Navy BRAC program. And on the top there, basically, you're seeing uh, sea level rise um, impacts of different, you know, my own, different uh, sea level rise scenarios and the purple is showing where groundwater with daylight or because of sea level rise. And some of those could be waste areas and that's not a good thing. So it became a lot of awareness there because a lot of the remedies at this particular site are leaving waste in place, protective, meeting all the requirements today of the regulations. But with the sea level rise, it's a new dimension where protectiveness may or may not be compromised. Uh, the Navy, with its extensive groundwater monitoring program, and also with the help of people at their ex facility in Puerto Nimi, is doing, a, as part of the next five-year review, a very comprehensive study of the existing groundwater data and projections. So they're not ignoring it, okay? Um, they're really getting ahead of the curve on this thing. Um, and I think that's happening at most, most of the naval facilities. Uh, city of Alameda Report 2020, the city itself, it's in the East Bay decided to do a report studying all the US Keys, waste areas and industries, and it showed quite a few sites that with uh, sea level rise in the Bay Area, um, you're gonna have issues with some of the sites being uh, impacted by shallower groundwater. So uh, some of those closures have to be re-examined. And put on top of sea level rise storm surge, and it's a whole another new dimension you'd have to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. That's my list of websites and references I put together over time. I, I definitely highlighted the uh, the ITRC Sustainable Resilient Remediation uh, reference. I think that these will be provided in a PDF, but there's quite a few. NOAA is US EPA, uh, US Geological Survey, uh, US Coast Guard, uh, a lot of agencies, a lot of information. Next slide. 
And of course, I had to highlight Sustainable Remediation Forum. Uh, on, they've got a wonderful uh, white paper on resilient remediation also. And there's some of the states that actually uh, have some links too. So it's really becoming kind of common across the board information readily accessible. Um, next slide. Okay, and, and you know, and, and, and one of the, you know, it's reality. I mean, I think, it, I hope no one on this phone call is doubting climate change, you know, but I mean, I've had people, you know, whether it's naturally or man-made, it's occurring. Uh, let's stick with the science. Let's deal with the results. Let's plan ahead, um, you know, so, and that, 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 that's a lesson I learned from the general in the Marine Corps when someone asked about climate change. He said, I don't care if it's man-made or it's naturally occurring. I have to deal with the result. And he said, well, my boys and girls have to go in harm's way, meaning U.S. Marines, uh, because some country's unstable or there's a drought and there's just chaos. Uh, that makes them my issue. And, and that's, the, that's the attitude. Of, I mean, I do believe climate change is, is, is a, exacerbated a lot by man-made stuff. But, um, you know, a bit of advice for people who are more recalcitrant about the whole thing, and they're still out there, um, we got to deal with the result. And to be protective of our remediation remedies and better remediation planning, uh, we have to basically get uh, ahead of the curve. And down below there is the no longer the case, but up until the incredible rain and snow season in California, uh, that was the U.S. seasonal uh, drought outlook map through the fall of 2022. Um, pretty scary, and some of those areas are still facing significant drought, and not a good thing. Um, everything we used to assume is only young, some of us are younger than others, this all seems to be in flux. Uh, next slide, please. And it can be done. So I guess we're up to questions here. Um, so I haven't looked at the chat. There's these questions. Uh, let me go to the next slide. I think it opens up for some closures from Sir. So I mean, sure. there we go. Oh, you can go back. Right. Um, the next slide. Sure, the next slide. Some um, final thoughts from Surf. Uh, thank you so much for that great presentation, Rick. Um, there's a lot of good resources out there. So if you haven't started to think about these kinds of things for the projects that you're working on, um, you can get started by checking out some of the, the resources that Rick provided. Um, some final thoughts from Surf here. You know, people are always asking, how can I get involved? Um, here's some good options for you. Become a member, um, join our, our cause, and get involved with the current events on the newsletter. Um, we host webinars on a, a typically a bi-monthly basis. If you have a topic that you're interested in presenting on or um, interested in seeing a presentation on, you can submit an idea to Chris Schultz or any one of the organizers um, on today's panel, myself and um, Betsy would be happy to hear from you. Um, and there is also technical initiatives that are um, ongoing as part of SURF's work. Our hot topic one that's happening right now is the Environmental Justice Technical Initiative. Um, the next team meeting is June 16th, and technical initiatives are only open to SURF members, so another incentive to join. Um, you can contact Nicole Tucker if you are interested in being involved. Um, I want to be a oh, go ahead. Sorry. Good, no, no, you go ahead. Yeah, I want to make a pitch for environmental justice. Uh, it's now become a very official policy and guidance in the Office of Land and Emergency Management, US CPA. It's becoming, it is, go, it is a policy and it's becoming ingrained in a lot of the circle process, including like the federal facilities. So um, there's a lot of great tools, EJ Screen, and uh, maybe down the road I'll give another webinar because I've got some presentations I've done for my classes on, on some of the tools you can use to understand how environmental justice may, may your site may be an environmental justice site or climate change mm -hmm. impact site. Sorry for yeah. the sidebar. No, it's that's definitely good information. These um, these are kind of you know topics that are going to quickly become um, re, you know regularly discussed, and it's kind of good to stay on top of them. So it's good. Um, 
we have the chat open. If you have any questions for Rick, please type your questions in there. Um, in the meantime, we can head to the next slide. Um, this is our final slide. I'd love to say a big thank you to all of the SURF sponsors listed here. Um, we really appreciate their support and their funding to be able to enable us to work on all of these great things. Um, the SURF YouTube channel uh, shows um, all of our past webinars and some other information on training videos for sustainable remediation tools. So you can check that out if you are interested in seeing any of our past webinars. We'll also be posting this one up there. Um, and we're having an upcoming event at the uh, Georgia Environmental Conference this August at Jekyll Island. Um, SURF will be having a booth there. So if you're attending, please swing by and say hello. All right, it looks like we have some questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Katie to facilitate the questions and discussion. Thank you. Great, thanks, Carolindy. Um, yeah, we do have a couple questions that came through in the chat. So the first one, um, how do you see community engagement's role in sustainable and resilient remediation, uh, specifically considering environmental justice communities? Yeah, that's actually, that's a good, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned just a minute ago that the Office of Land and Environmental Management, uh, and this maybe pertains more to Superfund sites and the CERC program at the federal level, uh, is, 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 is that's becoming a priority. You know, stakeholder engagement is critical across um, all these types of activities. Um, and, and it depends sort of on, you know, if it's a fund lead site at the state level or the federal level, um, every site's different. But environmental justice is like, I mentioned Hunter's point earlier. Uh, there was a, a nominee for the um, Superfund or the, uh, I forget exactly, the assistant uh, EPA administrator position uh, his first, he didn't, he withdrew his name after political headaches. His first stop when he was appointed was to Hunter's Point to talk with those communities of interest. Um, so, you know, a lot of the people on this call are probably practitioners, consultants doing the work, doing the cleanup. Um, I'm not sure how much public relations work they do, but you got to be aware of the fact that that's going to drive, that could drive the cleanup. Um, and some states are more ahead of the curve on that issue, others are behind the curve. So. Um, even without environmental justice, stakeholder stakeholder interest is important. And um, every site's different, every state is different. And some places it's really proactive, and other places, you know, you could do a cleanup in a neighborhood, and all you do is put up a site, and you, know, you don't have much of a program. So I'm I'm not sure we'll answer the question, but it's sort of case by case. But I think uh, be aware of it and engage it. And if it is a federal Superfund site, it's especially federal facilities. We uh, environmental justice guidance that OLEM put out targets federal facilities for very, very, very close scrutiny. Um, and then that may be because the PRPs are federal agencies like the Navy, the Air Force, uh, the Park Service, or the Coast Guard. So that really opens the door up more for having public participation. It could be through a remedial a RAB or a remedial advisory board or a uh, a CAC, a community advisory committee, things like that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have, um, is there any new information on how climate change, such as increasing temperatures or wet or dry climates, uh, might be impacting the prevalence or effectiveness of microbes used in bioremediation programs? I, I heard that concern for many, many years. I unfortunately, do not have that information readily available. It may be out there, um, bioremediation and climate change. But I do remember early on when SURF started developing the uh, their white paper on climate and resilient remediation, that was one of the issues of concern was how might that affect, um, you know, the uh, bio, bioremediation uh, community. It's a concern that's out there. I just don't have, it's there somewhere. I bet someone's doing the research in it. I just don't have that person that reference thin down, but you can use the master blaster of information in Google and probably find out something about it. <laughs> yeah, Go, Professor Google, always a good find. Um, 
Then uh, this last question we have here, um, Hurricane Harvey was especially impactful on a number of Superfund sites. Uh, what specific lessons do you think were learned from Hurricane Harvey that have affected the practice in significant ways? I think Hurricane Harvey was an eye-opener. I mean, a lot of people saw the news, not just waste sites, but industrial sites, and the lack of resilience and adaptation. Uh, I think more waste was released to the environment from just the normal standard industrial and commercial properties than the Superfund sites. And we also saw that uh, Hurricane Katrina, what happened there. And, uh, and soon after that, there was another hurricane, which I should remember the name of, which I don't, that devastated oil supply terminals. So I think, I think that was an eye opener. Um, and I think now that things are basically now moving in the right direction for people realizing we have to deal with these issues. Um, there's no avoiding it. Um, ETA is basically looking at it now very heavily, a lot of resources. Um, and um, I think, as I said earlier, I think basically part of uh, the circular process is going to include in your decision documents your proposed plans, identify, at least showing you've identified or considered climate impacts to your remedy, which, which could impact protectiveness and cost. You know, one of the things that, you know, this is this is something that we developed you know, when SURF first started, everyone said, oh no, this will all cost more. Uh, in this case, I think planning and protectiveness and vulnerability assessment and adapting accordingly is gonna save you a lot of money in the end in a worst case or medium case situation. So uh, say plan now, save later. I think that should be the new, uh, the new uh, underlying uh, motto within the uh, resilience community. Yes, so true. The earlier we can uh, start incorporating this stuff, the the better it is. Um, I think that was it for all the questions we had in the chat. Uh, Gerlindy, do you want to um, take it back over to close it out? Sure. Um, I think we can conclude here. I just want to say thank you to everyone for sticking with us. Thank you for joining. Um, love to hear from you through SURF. Um, contact information is on our website and we'll look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Thank you to Sir for allowing me the opportunity to share some thoughts. Rick, we're very grateful to have you. Thank you again.